is long COVID compatible with one of the most treacherous black runs in the Alps? Uh, let's find out in the interests of the great experiment. In this film, I'm going to look at what we know about the pathophysiology of long COVID and then see whether the 19th century treatment of convalescing in alpine mountain air might just have something to it. And if so, what are the universal lessons we might be able to apply to long haulers everywhere? So there's quite a lot to cover in this film. Let's get cracking with our current understanding of long COVID. Here's my thinking right now. We've got interconnected vicious cycles going on in multiple systems in our body and those vicious cycles create a cascade of issues which precipitate the symptoms we're all so familiar with. Well, what are those vicious cycles? Well, it does seem that one of them is metabolic and one of my next films will be diving into that in more detail. Another one of them is autoimmune, which is the cascade including the microclotting phenomenon that we've witnessed recently. A consequence of that microclotting is hypoperfusion of tissues, and that of course ties us back into the metabolic cycle. And the other cycle is autonomic. Our body's getting stuck in this fight or flight and sympathetic nervous system response, which then creates a cascade of problems, including autoimmune, and this leads us to even more autonomic issues. The elephant in the room, meanwhile, is the big fat question of persistent virus. Is there a reservoir or reservoirs somewhere in the body driving these responses? There's growing evidence in the research that there might just be so. I'll link to some of the relevant studies in the description. Now, if there is persistent virus, this begets another big question. Is it just the long haulers who have it or everyone who's had a COVID infection? My money would be on the latter, which suggests that it's our predisposition to a certain kind of immune response which leads to us suffering from long COVID. The fact that we've seen people recover from long COVID suggests that the body is either capable of clearing the persistent virus, if it's there, or simply learning to ignore it. But either way, whether there is or isn't persistent virus, we need to do whatever we can to break those vicious cycles. And you can't just do it by adding a single supplement to your regimen, doing a bit more breath work, or pacing better. It seems. <laughs> um, although all of those are of course essential for managing symptoms and giving us the best possible chance of recovery in any scenario. What I wanted to look at was staging an intervention on multiple fronts across body, brain and mind to see if we can throw a big enough spanner in the long COVID works to let our body's natural homeostasis find a way of taking control again. And that's where the whole subject of alpine retreats that may or may not include skiing come in. Now to quickly flag up the one word in there that may have got people's hackles up, um, that is the mind. Um, and just to be clear, as has always been the position on this channel, long COVID, like MECFS, is a biological illness with proven biological pathology and is in no way psychosomatic. The biopsychosocial lobby can go flush their papers down the proverbial toilet. However, as discussed in the film I made with Professor Tommy Wood, there's no shortage of studies showing that what goes on in our mind can affect our body, and most certainly when it comes to autonomic function. So to ignore it when we're looking to stage a multi-level intervention might be foolish. So what was I looking to achieve with this trip? Well, fundamentally to see whether a change in environment, behavior, stresses, and to some degree diet might enable greater activity levels, some degree of autonomic reset, and improvement in energy levels and symptoms. I think before going too much further in describing what happened out there, it's probably useful to provide some context on where I was at in my long COVID journey. So uh, a few weeks ago, I was 22 months in, and like all of us, having gone through dozens of games of snakes of ladders, including a particularly big one uh, with a false dawn last summer when I felt I was doing much better, only to subsequently slide back to where I'd been before. My symptoms uh, have included severe fatigue, brain fog, cognitive exhaustion, post-exertional malaise, headaches, tachycardia, allergies, intolerances, and horrible inflammatory skin issues. So off the back of those, towards the end of last year, I had some cycles of help apheresis in Germany, uh, followed by four weeks of anticoagulant therapy after microclots were spotted in my blood under a microscope, um, and then eight cycles of hyperbaric oxygen on my return to the UK. 
By the end of this period, I was feeling much better, as good or better than I ever had done on my long COVID journey. But unfortunately, uh, being the start of December in London, I was facing a catch-22 decision in the face of an exploding Omicron wave. Uh, do I get the booster or do I avoid it and increase the risk of a nasty Omicron infection? So faced with that, I figured better to get the booster. And possibly somewhat ill-advised, but the letter came through from the NHS and I couldn't really change it, um, for an appointment for a tilt test three days later. Uh, this chart is a very visual representation of what dysautonomia looks like, and I might discuss it on another film. Unfortunately, the combination of having the booster and doing the tilt test three days later set me back what felt like a year. So over Christmas and into the new year, I was feeling absolutely terrible. I briefly referred to it in my most recent recent film. Um, still very dysautonomic, uh, horrible cognitive fatigue, headaches, you name it, back to exactly where I was before. And so it was in that state that I decided to roll the dice on the big experiment. So how did it go? Well, uh, tra travel out to Geneva was hard work with all my ski kits, but fortunately once I arrived I had my brother and nephews to act as Sherpas and my brother to do the driving out to resort. So I got through the travel day without too many negative consequences. Day one on the mountain was rather interesting though. Altitude was obviously a factor, resort was at 1600 meters or 5000 feet, and the skiing obviously above that. I was very short of breath on just walking to the slopes and had mad tachycardia upon gentle skiing exercise. Um, there was one point when I stopped after just doing a few turns and noticed after about a minute my heart rate was still racing. I checked it and it was doing about 150. And for me, that's most definitely abnormal. I called it a day after a couple of hours and went home, uh, slept for two hours in the afternoon, did over an hour's breath work, almost two hours on my Alpha Stim device, and basically didn't get up again until dinner, and after that I went straight back to bed. Day two I felt okay in the morning, so I skied a, a bit more than I had done on day one. Um, I was generally less tachycardic and short of breath, um, and when I got back I did all the same furious resting upon getting home, slept for another two hours in the afternoon, which is very unlike me. Days three through five I continued to increase the skiing volume whilst still dedicating the afternoons to rest and parasympathetic stimulation. Uh, there was no PEM of consequence, although day four was a little rough. By day six, I was no longer having the tachycardic episodes or feeling short of breath, and I could skate along flat sections uh, without the body throwing a wobbler. And in the interest of the grand experiment, there was one particular slope I had to go and try. So behind me is the Swiss wall, which is famous for being well, one of the most notorious black runs. Uh, in the Port Soleil, and this is, I guess, a fairly big test of long COVID, to be quite honest, because the moguls are pretty big, and uh, it requires a little bit of effort. I am aware of my heart going moderately hard right now, and I've been going fairly slow, so yeah, I think if I get through today, <laughs> get through this, then that will be some achievement. And despite this potentially ill-advised mogul exploration, I got through day six fine too. So over the previous six days, I'd averaged 25 kilometers skiing a day and not had any negative consequences. Day seven, however, was going to be a big one. Could I do 25 kilometers skiing, one ill-advised rail, and a flight back to the UK instead of my usual dedicated rest time? Well, <laughs> fortunately not quite. Uh, that probably was a little bit much, as the following morning I didn't feel great. But by the afternoon I was okay, and right now, which is a couple of days after getting back, I'm feeling pretty much back to where I was pre-booster, which is pretty good. So, what are we to make of all this? Um, I think the combination of mountain air, sunshine, and reconnecting with an activity that I associate fundamentally with good health has done me a power of good. I would never have been able to manage the activity levels I did in the Alps back home. So why could I do it out there? Um, I think there's a few things. Uh, much more time dedicated to rest, breath work, sleep, and parasympathetic stimulation. Six to eight hours a day specifically of this, compared to perhaps only one hour in my home routine. I was also only doing one to two thousand steps a day in addition to the skiing, whereas back home I might be doing five to eight thousand steps. There was no work stress, no daily admin stress, washing, shopping, etc. No emails, no phone calls, no Zoom calls. My whole pattern of thought, and dare I say it indeed the pattern of illness, had been interrupted. 
And in cutting all of this out, I freed up a huge amount of my energy envelope that I could then spend on the mountain. And as long as I stayed inside that envelope, I do think I managed to recondition my autonomic system to some degree. A couple of other observations. Considering I've done literally zero exercise for almost two years, anything that's raised my heart rate over 110 I've stayed well aware from. Um, when I got out there I discovered that I really wasn't that unfit. The autonomic heart rate spiking was the limiting factor, not my muscle strength or stamina. I could pretty much ski as hard as my brother or my two sort of 20 year old nephews um, without too many problems, which I would say is a massive one in the face there for the it's just deconditioning school of thought uh, for what's causing long COVID. It was also a massive opportunity to reconnect with my body on a physical level, reconnect with nature and reconnect with, dare I say it, joy. And I know that's a bit of a woo-woo word, but hang with me here. Um, I think spending time doing something that made me feel exactly like the me that still exists in my head from my life pre-COVID was really quite powerful. When I was flying down the slopes in the glorious sunshine, I wasn't worrying about my step counts or when I need to preemptively lie down and do some breathing. And by interrupting those thought patterns in that way, I do think it helps us get the body out of fight or flight and spend more time in the rest, digest and heal where we need to be. And the more we can show the body that doing something active doesn't necessarily create negative consequences, then I think <laughs> dare I say it, the autonomic system becomes a little less trigger happy too. So overall, the trip was such a success that I'm going to go back out in a couple of weeks and I'm going to spend another week out there to see if I can build on the progress of last time. I'm still a long way from where I was pre-Covid. I can't eat pizza, I can't have a cold beer with lunch, uh, there's certainly no at prey ski um, and furious resting is required to even enable me to ski half a day. It's a long way from working full days and marathon training. Um, but at the same time, uh, being able to ski several half days on the bounce gives me real hope that full recovery is possible. Okay, so enough about me. Uh, here's the important stuff. How is this relevant for everybody else? Uh, the first part of uh, this whole experiment is the environment. I think there's a lot to be said for switching out of your daily normal environment for somewhere that you can cut yourself off from the daily stresses and thought patterns that dominate your life without you even realizing it. Can you get to the mountains or perhaps to the coast? Good weather is desirable, so maybe you do have to try and venture abroad, particularly at this time of year. But I am aware, of course, this is dependent on you being able to manage the associated travel. The big point here, don't underestimate the power of fresh air and sunshine. And whilst you're there, is there something you can do that reconnects you with the old healthy you without, of course, overdoing it? So, you know, staying inside your energy envelope is absolutely key. Unless you're an experienced skier, I wouldn't necessarily recommend you try exactly the same thing I did because you'll burn too much energy. That's why I didn't take my snowboard because snowboarding just demands more of you than skiing. I also wouldn't have been able to manage, for example, a walking holiday in the Alps. That would have been too much for me. But I could stand on two planks and let gravity slime me down hills. So fundamentally, if there is something you can do which does work in the same way for you, maybe swimming or yoga or something else, then I do believe it'll help create a more successful intervention in breaking some of those vicious cycles that function on so many different levels. I think we need to intervene in as many ways as possible to move the dial here. So how can you find that version of flow, which if you've ever done yoga you'll be familiar with the term, um, how do you find that and the physical connection to your body uh, in a way that works for you? you. Um, one of the ways I've tried to do it uh, in the last couple of years is through doing motorbike track days and I can just about get through each of those by resting between each session um, and this is kind of what I do in the absence of having been able to go skiing. It helps me find my flow and my reconnection with my physical self but unfortunately I do tend to be a bit pemmed afterwards as I can't factor in the dedicated time resting and I also haven't managed to change my environments in the process of going to do one and they're also just one-off single days. So I think as in interventions go, that for example um, hadn't been effective because it hadn't been working on enough of the levels at the same time.
I do of course need to add that you need to be at the right stage of your recovery to be able to try this kind of thing. There's no point going away if the travel alone would give you a relapse for a week. So you do need to be responsible. But on the flip side, I actually wasn't going to go on this holiday. My brother first suggested it. I thought there'd be no chance I'd be able to ski and it would just be exhausting travel for no reason. But it turned out that the environment and resting priorities meant I could do far more than I had previously envisaged possible. So what I would probably say is if you're on the fence about whether you're at the stage where you'd be able to manage something similar, I'd probably say go for it. So, in summary, can staging a multiple level intervention like this help reset those vicious cycles that stop us recovering from long COVID? Just maybe, yes. I really do think I managed to reset the autonomic nonsense that the booster set off in me and go back to where I was uh, before that, and my energy levels are improved too. Is this an N equals one experiment over a short time frame? Yes, of course it is. But I would add that anecdotally, the people I know who have recovered have generally done something pretty similar. They've got away from everything for a number of weeks or months and dedicated their energy to recovery and not just getting through the daily grind. I do think that there's something to the age-old adage of healing mountain air, and those Victorians and their convalescence retreats might just have been onto something. This has been a slightly unusual film, as you might have noticed. I try to avoid talking about myself as much as possible on this channel because I get a bit self-conscious and I kind of feel like I'm no more important than anybody else out there and who really cares how I'm doing. Anyway, don't worry, back to normal service with the next one. I'm going to catch up with Dr. Vensel on his latest paper and what it means for the metabolic connection with the microclotting pathologies we've discovered recently and what that might mean in terms of how we can treat long COVID. So look after yourselves, until next time.